In that statement, he was on the right side. Okay. I agree with every word that he says there. I do too. Every word. But you said in this statement. In that statement. For example, okay, we have to look at Jefferson a little bit more here. Um, Jefferson could never have been the representative of the Virginian people had he had any other views than those. Because the Virginian people were white, they were Protestant, and they were Baptist. And those white Baptist Protestants, all of them Calvinists for the most part, would never have sent Jefferson to the Continental Congress or the Constitutional Convention had he advocated anything other than that. So the Jefferson is an example of God using an ungodly man for good purposes, and we can never forget that. When God's people obey him and do the right thing, he will, the Lord will divide the camp of the devil and he will use certain of the devil's servants for the benefit of his people. And Jefferson is an example of that. Franklin is another example of that. Uh, Thomas Paine is another example of that. So, <clears throat> Jefferson, um, as you know, was a deist, but he was also involved with the Grand Orient Lodge of France, which was Jacobin. And the Grand Orient Lodge of Paris, France, was completely controlled by the Jesuits. It had become illuminized. And we must always keep our distinction between Freemasonry, low-level American Freemasonry at that time, and Illuminized Freemasonry. Okay. Explain that. Okay. <clears throat> Freemasonry was formally revived in 1717 in England. England became the Grandmother Lodge. Um, it is a fact that the purpose for the formal revival of Freemasonry was to restore the Roman Catholic Stuarts to the throne of England because they had been driven out in 1688, the Glorious Revolution of 1688, William and Mary come take the throne in 1689, set forth the Bill of Rights, of which comes our Bill of Rights, from which comes that. And so the Jesuits were foiled at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 when uh, William III fought with the armies of Louis XIV and King James II. And Louis XIV and King James II were absolute and total Jesuits in their heart, souls, and kingship. They even called themselves Jesuits. And Louis XIV had, I believe, nearly a 60-year reign in France. He began his reign, I think, at the age of 14. And Hollywood depicts him as a great king in one of DiCaprio's movies, uh, The Man Behind the Mask. It goes on to say Louis XIV became one of the greatest kings of France. He was a vicious, adulterous, murderous traitor, killed out the Huguenots. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 drove them out, totally destroyed the, really the productive capacity of France. He destroyed the best of his population. Louis XIV was wicked. And so the Jesuits, in using... Uh, using Freemasonry, they revived it in England in 1717 for the purpose of using certain Protestant rulers and leaders to bring them into the Masonic Lodge, camouflaged as something virtuous, and, uh, but unbeknownst to many of them, it would be used as an engine for papal restoration in England. Well. In 1754, the Jesuits at their College of Clermont in Paris, France, wrote the first 25 degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. And I have that quoted in my book. I have the source. It's a Masonic quiz book. Ask me another brother, written by the Masons. <laughs> so the Jesuits were the authors of the first 25 degrees of the Scottish Rite. And even Madame Blavatsky will tell you in Isis Unveiled that the Jesuits are the true authors of every rite of Freemasonry. And she would know because she was a Jesuitist and a co-Mason. So, <clears throat> we have the revival of Freemasonry in 1717 and the Jesuits seeking to use it as an engine for papal restoration. But what happens is, um, God sends a, the first great awakening in the 1735-1740 era with the preaching of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. 
and shortly thereafter you have the first great Masonic schism in about 1750 and this divides the Masonic Lodge from the Continental to the English and the English Masons and the American Freemasons cease to be a an engine of conspiracy for the Jesuits because it broke away this is why to a certain degree I support Leo Zagami if he wants to have a Masonic schism I say praise God and let's get it on divide the Masonic camp so even though he may still be working for high-level Freemasonry maybe even he's a Jesuit agent I don't know but I'm for him causing Masonic schism because if it wasn't for the Masonic schism they wouldn't have no, you would have not had the suppression of the Jesuits in 1773 by the Pope or their expulsion from Portugal Spain and France all done by French by Freemasons of those countries so I advocate a Masonic schism and so at the time of the Revolutionary War when it started in 1775 we're in the midst we had a great awakening the great awakening caused a great nationalism to arise the result of the Great Awakening was our armies were filled by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Presbyterians and Baptists to fight this war of tyranny against King George III and George was a, a total tool of the Jesuit order. King George III took in the Jesuits when they were suppressed and kicked out of all the Roman Catholic countries in Europe. When the Pope suppressed them in 1773, uh, King George takes them in after one of his ministers had a secret council with Jesuit General Ritchie. So England becomes the dumping ground of all the European Jesuits. And so they then implement their tyrannical, uh, their Council of Trent in attempting to destroy Protestantism in the colonies by afflicting the colonists. Uh, the Navigation Acts and so on, you can only use English shippers. Under Cromwell, uh, the colonies could use any shippers they wanted. We had true freedom of commerce under Cromwell as when we had colonies. Well, not with King George III, you can only use English shippers. And they jacked the price up and made it impossible to make a profit, just like they're doing to us now. No matter what you do in your business enterprise, you cannot make a profit now. And so they were doing the same thing to the colonists. Well, the English Freemasons and the American Freemasons were working together. They were anti-King George III, anti-Pope. And uh, so they were involved in the Boston Tea Party, and involved in some of the great movements that led to the American Revolution. But the Revolution was Protestant. It was based upon Protestant principles. It was carried out by a white Protestant population. There were three million people in the colonies, only 30,000 Roman Catholics and 24 priests. The rest were all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. We had, I think, 500,000 black slaves at the time. I think that's what Blake says in his history of slavery and the slave trade that was written in 1860. But the white population was Protestant. And we were driven here by the inquisitions of Europe. Every city in Europe had an auto de fe. It had a fire burning heretics regularly on a daily basis. And so we fled after 200 years of persecution. And God gave us this place. That's why Squanto was on the shore when the pilgrims arrived and he speaks English. And he helps them and he saves their very lives. Because God was, uh, was saving his church, a remnant of his church, giving them a place to worship him according to his word, the Bible, the Reformation Bible, the AV 1611 and the Geneva Bible, which came essentially from the same underlying Greek text. The Reformation Bible, which we call it. So <clears throat> we have the English and the American Freemasons separated from Grand Orient Freemasonry on the continent, which includes not only the Grand Orient Lodge of Paris, it's going to include Frederick the Great, 